and uh, I had gotten very, very ill. I remember preaching the sermon hanging on the side of the, the pew or the, uh, the pulpit there, and uh, it was one of the most powerful moves of the Holy Ghost I think I've ever seen, as long as in my time of preaching. So I know that God can use our little effort and make something of it. So that's what I'm asking the Lord to do. Uh, most importantly, that you get what it is God's trying to say. If you have it, say amen. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to read through to verse number 4. Most of you may know this by heart, but uh, we're going to read it anyhow. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, he said unto them, When ye pray, our Father which art in heaven, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us the, uh, today by day our daily bread, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Look back at verse number 1 real quick. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, and he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Teach us to pray. Think about that for just a minute before we pray. What was it that his disciples saw? What was it that they felt that made them want to experience the same thing? Was it the words they heard him speak, power and authority? Was it what they felt in the atmosphere when he began to pray? That when he got done, that they said, teach us how to do that. Show us how to do what you just did. I don't know, but that just gives me chills to know that you can pray in such a way that you can change the atmosphere that people say, show us how to do what you just did. I'd like to preach this morning on something the Holy Ghost gave me on three kinds of prayer. Three kinds of prayer. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord this morning? Let's begin to pray. Father, we love you this morning. We appreciate the Word of God. We're asking you this morning, God, to talk to us as a church. Speak to us right out of the Word of God. We're asking you this morning to illuminate our, our mind, our conscience, our understanding. To help us to be able to get a hold of the Word of God and to change whatever needs to be changed, we can draw closer to you and be an effective witness for the kingdom of God and stay on this pathway of righteousness for your name's sake. We'll give you praise for everything you do this morning and all of God's people can say amen. Amen. And you pray this morning the Lord will touch me and my body as well. Three different kinds or three kinds of prayer. When I read this little text or passage, I'm reminded of the many times that I've heard God's people recite what they know or call the Lord's Prayer. They begin to talk about this thing that God had instructed His disciples on about prayer. When I look into this thing called prayer, there's no shortage of books, uh, articles, and things that have been written over the years. If we were to look back historically, there's no shortage of great writers. E.M. Bounds wrote a lot about prayer. Some of the great men of God from many years gone by, there are literally, if we were to take a, uh, an audit of all the books written on prayer, there's no telling how many thousands of books, words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters of commentary that has been written about prayer. 
The sad part is of all the things we have written on prayer, it's probably one of the least done things or things that are done by the child of God. You can know the truth, but if you don't put the truth and these, this thing of knowledge about prayer into action, doesn't do you a lot of good. But I begin to think about prayer. It's that thing that we consistently see throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now, I know this morning that people may argue over opinions of Scripture, doctrine, over laws, and many other such things that are in the Bible, like who wrote what book. And you may argue about a lot of things. But one thing that is nearly impossible to argue is that from Genesis to Revelation, that prayer is that one thing that is considered a pipeline of communication between God and man. I mean, what people could argue that? That is a fact in the Word of God. Throughout the Bible, we see prayer is used by God's child or God's people as a way to communicate hardship, fear, sorrow, and need. It's a way to communicate love, a way to communicate trust and faith and reverence between God's people and God. It's not just in the Bible, but even today, prayer, I believe, is one of the most neglected things of all powerful resources that you and I have at our fingertips. It's one of the most neglected things that I see, amen, of God's creation. Unfortunately, this morning, prayer tends to be more of a last-minute bailout for most people than it is a conversation between God's creation and the creator. How many knows that to be true? Have you ever been in a place in your life that it seemed like things were not going that well and one of the first instincts is, well, I'll pray about this. Or somebody gets sick and I'll pray about this. Why is it that we wait until we're sick? We wait until we're broke. We wait until we're in the bottom. We wait until we're depressed before that we ever pray Pray and talk to God. You see, what began to stir my heart, what began to happen was yesterday. I was riding down the road and I began to think about the fact that I'm so busy. I'm trying to play catch up after being sick and everything going on in my life. And I remembered that a lady had private messaged me on Facebook about praying for another sister. We prayed for her at the beginning of service, those of you that remember. And so I began to ride along and I thought, you know, I didn't really have time to look and see everything she said in that message and instead of me trying to respond by texting something out while I'm driving down the road, it's probably a lot safer and a lot wiser for me to just call her on the phone. And so she called me on the phone. I sent her a little message and said, just call me when you get a chance. A few minutes later, she called me on the phone. She began to express what was going on and I apologized to her. I said, I've been real busy, but I didn't want you to think that I forgot about what was going on. And I understand this is a very serious thing that you wanted me to pray about. And she began to explain to me what was going on. I shared with some of you this morning. She said that this one particular sister who's been following our ministry online as well, she said that her, her blood pressure had gone way up. And I forget exactly, but it was somewhere around 200 over 99. And her, and her pulse had gone up to like 150 or 160. And the next thing, she's already has got other complications from uh, physical problems and whatnot. And so they called an ambulance and they picked her up, took her to the hospital. And they were having a hard time, I guess, getting that leveled out. And so she wanted me to pray for her. And I thought to myself at that moment, you know, there's a lot of talking we can do and we can sit here on the phone and we can discuss all the problems that there are. We can sit here on the phone and discuss how bad that it really is. But I thought to myself, if we really believe in the power of prayer, why don't we just go ahead and do it and, and, and obey God and ask God to move in this situation. And so you know she has a lot of confidence in our ministry. She has expressed that many different times. But you see at the bottom line, the end of the day if the Lord don't move, if his hand 
don't move in this situation. I'm really nobody. I'm just another preacher of the gospel. But I believe that if we trust God in prayer, that things can happen. How many believes that by faith this morning? And so I began to set out. I said, sis, why don't we just, are you all right? But let's just go ahead and let's start praying right now. And here I am driving down the road. It's probably 60 miles an hour. And I started out, set out to begin to pray. And I began to pray from my heart. I began to feel the Holy Ghost coming to that a truck. And I'm telling you, on the other end of the phone, we just kept praying. We kept on pressing and kept on praying. And you know, I began to feel the Holy Ghost stronger and stronger. I began to feel the words begin to flow from my spirit. I began to cast out every false imagination, every doubt, every bit of discouragement. I began to rebuke every demonic force. And it began to come against that sickness. And all of a sudden, I heard her on the other end of the phone as the Holy Ghost came into the room where she was at and began to move on her and she began to speak in tongues uh, as the Spirit gave the utterance. Uh, amen. Before it was over with, both of us had a move and a demonstration and a manifestation uh, of the Holy Ghost because of this thing called prayer. Now, we could have talked all day long about how bad it was and I could have said, I'll pray for you. We'll get around to praying later. But let me tell you, the problem is uh, that a lot of times uh, our prayer is really not what it should be and it's not as fervent and it's not what it should be when we really get down to pray. How many of you remember the prayer meetings uh, where the child of God got down to pray and we weren't worried about if everybody heard us. We didn't care if there was a lot of music playing in the background. We didn't care if the drum beat was 100 miles an hour, but we began to pray. And you might have heard a sister over here who just barely praying above a whisper. And you got another brother over here who's really calling out to the Lord in fervency and calling out on the name of God. Can I tell you, amen, no matter how you pray, as long as you do pray, that's when you begin to see a demonstration of God's spirit and power in the church. You show me somebody that is spiritual and I'll show you somebody that prays. You hear me, church? It's one thing to be emotional. It's another thing to be spiritual. There's a big difference between being emotional and being spiritual. Can I tell you, there's a fragrance in your life. There's an aroma of the Holy Ghost. Whenever you begin to pray, there's a fragrance of the Spirit of God in your life. You show me somebody that knows how to pray, somebody that knows how to get a hold of God, and I'll show you somebody that when they stand up and testify, the rest of the church can acknowledge the anointing of the Holy Ghost that is on their life. Let me tell you this morning, when that anointing begins to manifest, it is a byproduct of a life of prayer. Can you say amen? You show me somebody that is anointed and spiritual. Amen. If you tell me, well, Brother Myers, they don't really pray a lot, just some. Get a hold of this. Honey, if God anoints you that much and God helps you that much with that little bit of prayer life, just imagine what would happen if you really set out to pray and get a hold of God. Man, I, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. How many knows the difference between this casual, half-hearted stuff that some people call prayer and I'm talking about genuinely breaking through into the spirit realm? How many's ever had the spirit pray through you? Huh? Let me tell you what's wrong with a lot of our churches. One of the biggest things is that we forgot how to pray until the Spirit takes over. And I tell you, there's been a lot of prayer services, dynamic prayer services, where the children of God tapped in to the Holy Ghost and God began to move. I'm nowhere near where I need to be right now, but you just, as far as this sermon's concerned, but I'm gonna just follow the leading of the Holy Ghost, and I'm gonna testify for just a minute. Is that okay? I remember just a few years ago, I've testified of this before, but I was going through one of the most difficult times in my entire life. And I remember that we had a group of men in this church that stood behind me and said, Brother Myers, we're going to pray with you. We're going to believe God with you. We're going to trust God for a great outcome and for 
an answer. We started out at my house. We walked around that house. I remember that we had a little red ribbon that was similar to that red ribbon that they, uh, in context of that, that they hung in the window. Amen, that scarlet thread. And one of the brethren said, let's get this thread and we're gonna anoint it and we're gonna attach it all over the house. We went around my house, Brother Tim, and we prayed over every corner of the house. Amen, we tacked up with a little thumbtack. I don't know, it may still be there. I don't remember, it's still there maybe. Amen, tacked up that little red ribbon right above our door and we anointed that and we prayed over, my God, we felt the Holy Ghost. You see, we could have just sat around and said, well, God will move, God will do this, and God will do that. But we began to pray and God began to manifest itself through prayer. The next thing you know, we we decided to come to the church. Amen. That prayer was great. But like a good dinner, you want to go back for seconds? Honey, let me tell you, when you know that you're really praying, it'll make you want to go back for seconds. When you really are touching the hem of his garment through prayer, you're going to want to keep doing it. Somebody said that habits form because the mind connects with what reward that it received the last time. That's what causes habits. And so in other words, if a person puts a cigarette in their mouth and they smoke it, they mean the body says that it enjoyed the nicotine high and so it creates a habit to do it again. Let me tell you, in the spirit, if you find yourself in an altar prayer and you get rewarded in prayer and you feel the Holy Ghost, you're gonna come habitual in prayer. Somebody say amen. You see, the reason why that some of us don't pray more is because you haven't developed a habit of prayer because you never really tapped in to the Holy Ghost. But let me tell you, when you tap in and when you touch heaven's board, when you touch heaven, I'm telling you, heaven touches you. It's gonna wanna make you go back for seconds. Somebody say amen. I prayed right around the altars of this church. As a matter of fact, I laid right, right here, right there. That's where I was just a few years ago in desperate, desperate need of an answer. Other brethren were around here praying. You could hear them praying. And then I'm going to tell you something. When you're in a place of desperation, you pray differently. Somebody say Amen. You pray differently. You shouldn't have to wait till you're desperate, but you just do. But we were praying out, crying out to the Lord. Some people said you ain't got to get emotional. But when you get desperate, you get emotional. You might cry. You might weep. You might get angry at the devil. But you're going to get some kind of emotion stirred because of what you feel. But Brother Billy, we began to pray. And I remember that it was almost like that the more we prayed that you could feel something rising up in the church service. Now, we sing songs like Break Every Chain. There's an army rising up and we start getting visuals in our mind of chains breaking off and God doing great things. That's what happens when we sing songs like that. But do you know what gives us the right and the reason to even sing a song like that is whenever you've had a chain breaking experience. And let me tell you what, amen, as I laid there in prayer and I began to seek God, I felt something rise. I got feel the Spirit of God lift it. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost gave out a message. Here we are praying. There ain't no church service. Ain't no preaching. Ain't no singing. None of that. Some folks think that unless we got, amen, a big choir and we're singing 90 miles an hour and we're singing something that'll make us excited, make us want to jump, hop, and get our emotions stirred that we can't have a move of God. Let me tell you something. That was one of the greatest moves of God that this preacher's had in a long time right there. But all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost gave out a message and this is what he said. I may not get it exact but pretty close the Holy Ghost spoke and said you have moved in faith now watch as I move for you (laughs) and as sure as I'm standing flat footed here in shoe leather God did it because when you contact God through that pipeline called prayer and heaven hears what you got to say I believe that God moves. And can I tell you, God knows exactly what we need. 
amen, it wasn't but a few months after that, amen, that we were in a situation where that we were still praying about a few other things, still needing God to move a few other mountains out of the way. And I remember one night we was in revival. Brother Scott Smith was preaching. It was just all right if I testify. I got more to preach, but I, I feel like testifying to you how God does. Amen. But Brother Scott Smith was preaching that revival. And I don't remember what happened. I don't even remember if he preached that night. But I remember standing right about over here. The Holy Ghost come on me. And I'm not like some of these people that you just breathe your hockey breath on somebody and they fall out like all over the place and ain't got a drop of the Holy Ghost in it. You know what I'm saying? But I believe that whenever the real Holy Ghost gets in it, amen, that you're going to see people fall out in the spirit. Come on, somebody. I've seen people lay in the floor with one eye open looking around like, when you really get in the Holy Ghost, it's going to be a lot different than some of this mess you see today. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not one to just fall. You see me fall out, you know it's the Spirit of God. Because I ain't falling out for nobody to impress anybody. Come on, crack my noggin on the front of a pew. I've done seen that happen before. But I laid across that floor and I felt something come over me and I felt just like that somebody had electric probes connected into me. I remember feeling my whole body jerking and twitching all over like that I was plugged into a 220 light socket. And I remember as I laid there on that floor, God gave me a vision. I've shared it with some of you, but as I laid on that floor, I remember that I could see these ghostly looking gray like transparent figures that would fly down and they would fly and they would stop and then go right back up. And I kept thinking as I laid there, what is that? What is that supposed to mean? But then the Spirit of God reminded me and showed me what it meant. You see, the devil can only get so close to you. Amen. When there's a prayer hedge, when there's the blood of Jesus Christ, that devil can't get but so close. I had an overflowing of joy unspeakable and full of glory. Honey, when I got up out of that floor, I felt like a Marine fresh out of boot camp. Where's the devil? I'm going to dot a devil's eye. Anybody ever felt like that? I mean, honey, when you really pray, that's how you feel. Huh? Come on. Where's the devil at? I'm going to find me a devil, and we're fixing to go toe to toe. That's the way you feel when you get to victory. I remember going home that night, and uh, I told my wife, I said, oh, what I felt tonight. She said, the Lord really touched you, didn't he? I said, yeah, he sure did. I told her what the Lord showed me. I said that the devil's trying to get at me, but every time he gets so far, the Lord won't let him get but just so close. She said, are you sure about that? I said, yes. She said, well, I've got something I've been holding out on you. She said, we got a letter from some place, and she said, I've been praying about this because I didn't know what to do. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, let me show you the letter. She showed me the letter, and by all intents and purposes, had I read the letter, possibly before that night, I would have probably crumbled like, you know, old dry cornbread. I would have probably fell all to pieces. But you see what happened was because I touched the hem of his garment in prayer. When she showed me that letter, I thought to myself, that's exactly what God was trying to show me. It doesn't matter how close that devil thinks he's going to get. You can't touch somebody covered in prayer. Let me tell you something this morning. There's some of you that you've been kind of playing games and just praying little half-hearted prayers. It is high time that you pray until you pray through. You want to know why we don't have greater church services? It's because we forgot how to pray through. A preacher can preach an anointed message for an hour straight, just about give himself slap out, and we'll come down to an altar. Now I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord was so to keep. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Give me life. Amen. Get up and go home. Am I right, somebody? Folks, you may look at this preacher and say, we've been praying, Brother Myers. My question is, what kind of prayer have you been praying? If you're somebody here this morning that has come up around this thing and you've seen some of the greatest moves of God because of prayer, raise your hand. Keep it up for a minute. I want you to look around. There are people that are in this church service that have seen some great, great things because 
Somebody knew how to pray. Somebody say, help us this morning. You see, I know this morning that there are many different things throughout the Bible as far as aspects of prayer, like the prayer of faith that will save the sick. But the more that I prayed about this and the more the Spirit of God began to deal with me, I believe that we can narrow it down to at least three different kinds of prayer. And I'm not going to stay here very long, but I'm going to show you some of you have been praying in such a way there's a reason why you're not seeing your prayers answered. Let me say this. As I was getting shower this morning, all these things were running through my mind. And I was thinking to myself, you see, we have all these different things in our mind that we think that if I pray like this or do like this or what have you, then I'm bound to get an answer. You see, I see two different things that I can show you here. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Bible said he prayed until his sweat became as. Now, you can argue all day whether it was, but it was as great drops of blood. Whether it was or not, I guess we can ask him when we get there whether it was real blood. He prayed. When you pray like that so that your sweat looks like big, great drops of blood pouring off of your face, whether it was or was like it. Would you agree? That ain't no half-hearted prayer. He was not, Father, please let this cup pass from me. Honey, he was praying in such a way that the weight of the world was on his shoulders, and that's how he prayed. You sit here and look at me and say, well, I really want God to give me an answer. I really want to see God. Let me ask you how you are praying. But on the flip side, we read about a beautiful woman by the name of Hannah who prayed, and she prayed in such a way that the Bible tells us that Eli thought she was drunk because what? She prayed, but you could hear no voice coming out of her lips. You could hear her, vo her voice wasn't raised up real high. You know what that tells me? Whether you like Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and maybe praying out loud, praying like a crazy Pentecostal preacher, or maybe you're praying like someone grieved because you have a barren womb. What really matters is whether when you pray, whether your heart is in your prayer. Somebody say amen to me this morning because I believe that when we really get a hold of God, he knows whether your heart's in that prayer or not. He knows whether or not your soul is in that prayer or not. You ain't fooling God. You might get down. Folks, I've been around this a long time. I've seen wildfire. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen people go to the altar and pray, and it wasn't no more than just a casual prayer because they didn't want nobody to think they are backslid by staying on the pew. Because sometimes us preachers have a real good way of making feel, people feel guilty because they didn't come to church, because they didn't go to the altar, because they didn't do a lot of things. Let me tell you something. When you go to that altar, you ought to look at it like a divine meeting place. We have got to the point that when we first got saved, if you were praying over your lunch or your supper, dinner, whatever you call it, you prayed sincerely. Father, would you bless this food we're about to receive? We give you thanks for it. We ask you to sanctify it, and it meant it came from your heart. Now, it's got to the place where our little half-hearted prayer has become, Lord, bless this cheeseburger in the name of Jesus, amen. And then you take a bite. You didn't no more mean that prayer as anything else. The only reason why you prayed it was out of obligation to your spiritual life. And you want to know that why that we're no more spiritual than we are? Let me tell you something this morning. You might have a habit of prayer by making a certain time. Well, I'm going to pray every morning at 9 o'clock, every night before I go to bed. Do you understand that even whenever you have set times to pray, that if you're not careful, that it can become so uh, such a ritual to you in a way that it really has no meaning or anything to it. I'm going to tell you this morning, it's time that the church understands that we need a breakthrough in this hour. Uh, folks, we are, our world is in a mess, and the only thing that's going to help is a praying church. The Bible said that he told the church that this should be a house of prayer. You can't hardly get people to come revival. You can't hardly get people to come to a fundraiser, spaghetti dinner, let alone a prayer meeting. You tell 
folks were going to have prayer. And they might have two or three. But some of them only come out of obligation because I'm part of the church or I've got a position. It is a sad statistic, folks. Oh, my God, would you help your church this morning? I feel like we're in trouble. Say amen, somebody. These are the three kinds of prayer. And if you'll get a hold of this, this may not be your typical Sunday morning sermon. Maybe this would have been better to teach. But if you'll get a hold of this, I believe you'll begin to see some things changing in your life. There's some of you here this morning, maybe there's a specific thing that you've been praying about casually, half-heartedly, or an answer you've been wanting, and it seems like it's gone on for an eternity, and you're no better than you were six months ago. No more answer than you were praying for two years ago. You want the will of God this morning? Let me shake your head and say yes. The first kind of prayer that the Holy Ghost showed me is empty prayer. That is a prayer that is void of any real intention. A prayer without desire or emotion. It's a prayer that is empty or void of any spiritual connection. And unfortunately, all too often, we're guilty of empty prayer. What do you mean by that, Brother Myers? Well, have you ever had somebody say, Sister Tammy, you know, my husband's having surgery or whatever the situation. Would you pray for him? Lord, touch so-and-so's husband. And you and I know as well as I'm standing here, a lot of them empty prayers, you know the difference between whenever you decide. I'm not just going to pray some empty, loose prayer. Lord, touch so-and-so. Because what happens is right inside of here, you're void of any real spiritual connection. You have no real genuine intention. And in most cases, you're not praying for them the way you would if that was your husband. Just an empty prayer to God. It's like sending up a balloon to God with nothing in it. No real intention, no real desire. Oh, I really would like to see our church blessed. I really would like to see our church filled. I really would like. You know, there's a lot of things people say that they really would like, but they're not willing to pray to get what it is they say they really would like. You see, the thing is, a lot of these prayers are just so empty, void of any real intention. Because what I found out about humanity, when we really intend to do something, you will almost kill yourself to do what you really intend to do. You don't care if you have to show up late. You don't have, care if you have to halfway do it. You don't care what it takes. You don't care how you have to get it done. If you really intend on doing something, you will find a way to do it. Whenever you're void of intention, you see, when there's no real intention there, you don't make sacrifices to make that prayer. You won't stop what you're doing. Well, I'm about to go into a business meeting. Honey, whenever you get some real intention and genuine motive behind your prayer, you might tell the guy that you're about to meet, give me about five minutes. i got to go find me a place to pray. How often have we been on the phone with somebody and I can say that I've been guilty? Amen. Many a times. And I'm praying, God, help me with that. We've been on the phone with somebody. Somebody said, well, I've really been sick the last couple of weeks, you know, and all of this kind of thing and that kind of thing. And Oh, I really could use some prayer, Brother Myers. I'm really going through it. You might be talking to somebody on the other end of the phone that's about to commit suicide and you don't even know it. And your empty prayer might be the reason why that you don't touch God for whatever it is that they need. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't want to be the, on the receiving end of that. But how many times have we been in right in an opportunity, standing in the middle of a grocery store somewhere, and somebody begins to tell you about their unfortunate situation? 
well, our family's been going through something, and so-and-so passed away, and this one's grieving, and that one's going through depression, and this one's turned back to alcohol. When's the last time it's standing right in the middle of a grocery store, no matter who was watching or what was going on, your intention and your genuine desire was so great that you didn't care. You grabbed somebody by the hand and said, let's pray right now. You didn't care if you was checking out and you just swiped your credit card and the cashier was waiting on you. Your intention was so genuine, and you believed God in such a way that you were going to touch heaven no matter what it took. Somebody say amen. You see, what's happened is our intention and our motive ain't no greater than the the need is, and so we don't see the need met. And so we're in a situation where there's a great need, and there we stand with an opportunity, but we're more worried about who's going to see us. We're more worried about who might hear us or how it might turn out or how it might sound or what happens if they don't get healed and all of that stuff. Honey, when you really get a burden for souls, you're going to start praying like you never prayed before. Just an empty prayer with no spiritual connection. When you pray a full prayer, (coughs) when you really make a genuine prayer before God, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you've ever been in that place where you made that connection and there was no doubt in your mind, you had prayed until the Spirit moved. And you knew your prayer was headed to heaven. Anybody? Raise your hand. You've seen it. You felt it. I started to move on, but the Spirit of the Lord wouldn't let me just yet. I've been in a many a camp meetings, youth camps, services where the people pray around altars. God, give him the Holy Ghost. Lord, give him the Holy Ghost. Oh, Spirit, fill him with the Spirit. God, fill him with the Spirit. And we get content with, whoa, fill him with the Spirit. God, fill him with the Spirit. I don't care how much you bunny hop. I don't care how much you jump, you shout, you jerk, and all of that. If that prayer is empty, you ain't doing a whole lot. Because you will never scream a demon out of somebody. You ain't never going to hop a devil out of nobody. You're, now, I know there's some that are trying, and they're going to punch the spirit in somebody. Stay away from that stuff. But there's been way too many prayers that we have prayed, and you got something else on your mind. Have you ever been guilty when the pastor said, come on up and pray for so-and-so. They're going to stand in the need. And you get up out of your pew casually Lord touch Jesus Lord touch Jesus there's no intention there there's no real motive there you see this is the pastor coming out of me right here because if we expect to move mountains and if we expect to get answers folks there's a reason why that when Jesus went to pray for that little 12-year-old girl that they said had died, there's a reason why that when he walked into the room that he put out the doubters, he put out those that are going to be a hindrance. Do you know that empty prayer can be a hindrance? How many of you this, this morning's willing to say, I've probably been guilty before, Pastor Myers, But from here on out, I'm asking God to help me. The second kind of prayer that the Holy Ghost showed me was a carnal prayer. Carnality has to do with the bodily pleasures and fleshly appetites. It's the kind of prayer that does not align with God's word and God's will. It's kind of like an escaped convict praying that he don't get caught. Or God will give you somebody else's husband. Carnal. Well, Lord, if I could just move to so and so location, they got better houses and better cars, and the cost of living's cheaper, and all of that. To consume it upon your own, it's all about the flesh and what benefits you. And you say, well, Lord, the cost of living, and you ain't prayed not one minute about whether or not that's the Spirit of God or the will of God for your life. And a lot of times people get in the altar, and these are the kind of crazy prayers that that I call carnal prayer when you get down the altar and say, God, allow that real estate agent to call me back. 
Now, you didn't one time ask God if that was even his will or not, but you're saying, God, let so-and-so call me back because I'm waiting on that call because we're ready to move. I don't know if I can bring this out exactly the way the Holy Ghost gave it to me. Sometimes people are praying carnal stuff. You got somebody that's cheering over here for the 76ers and somebody over here praying, praying for the Orlando Magic. God, let Michael Jordan hit that three-point shot. Your carnal prayer is not doing you any good. It's not doing anybody else any good. God, don't let me get caught in this situation. God, don't let me get in trouble for what I did. You see, the problem is, is it's all about you. It's all about self. What I can get out of this. You ever heard the term jailhouse religion? I honestly believe that there's a lot of people that are more saved in our jails than there are some out here sitting in the pew. But I will tell you this because I preached in the jails. There's a lot of them in the jail that they're using religion while they're there as a crutch to lean on like God is some kind of genie in a bottle. God, when I go before that judge, don't let him give me this kind of sentence. God, let me get past this and God this and God that. You see, that prayer has nothing to do with their deliverance or their spiritual life or about anything that will benefit them in the kingdom of God. It's all about self. You understand that your carnal desires, I know God can give you strength, God can give you deliverance, but if a child of God was in the same situation and said, God, I'm remorseful, I repent of what I did, if you'll have mercy when I go before that judge, when I get out of here, I'll serve you all the days of my life, I'll be true to you. There's a big difference between that and somebody that's just wanting God to give them a bailout at the last minute. Let me tell you this morning, if you're praying, praying empty or if you're praying carnal or if you're praying this morning in such a way, amen, that it's all about you, you're going to find yourself in a place where you're not seeing your prayers answered. But as I prayed going down the road yesterday, I began to think to myself, God, that was the kind of prayer. That right there that was the kind of prayer that I've been needing to do for my own lost loved ones. That was the kind of prayer that I just prayed that I should have been praying about some situations with our church. And folks, I've prayed, but sometimes a man has to be a man and a woman has to be a woman and admit whether or not they really have prayed with real intention. God help us to begin to have altar services. God help us to begin to have services where the climate changes because the people in the pews have renewed themselves and reminded themselves what it means to pray. I want to give you a challenge as a pastor. From here on out, Every time there's an opportunity, you find somebody struggling. Every time there's a problem, if you really believe in prayer like you say you do, stop right then and do whatever you got to to pray. Right then. Don't let the devil give you any kind of reason or rhyme as to why that you cannot touch God right then and right there. I mean, you might be in a situation where you got to wait 30 minutes or 5 minutes, but honey, you better stop letting these opportunities to pray with people while you have a chance. I believe those opportunities present themselves when they do for a particular reason. Stand to your feet this morning. You and I have been faced with so many opportunities to pray with somebody. Come here, Sister Miles. Nearly every single Sunday morning when I wake up or go to bed, my wife has got one of the worst headaches so bad that she can't hardly even open her eyes in the morning. And it really bothers me. If you've battled with headaches like that, you understand what it feels like. And if you get real hard and you think, oh, she's all the time got a headache, you better watch out because you'll have some other problem and you'll be laid into bed with some kidney stones or you have headaches. But in compassion, I think to myself, this morning we woke up 
And she rolled over, and she put her hand on me, and she said, Honey, I've got a really, really, really bad headache. Would you please pray for me? Sister Baggett, will you play the piano for me this morning, if you don't mind? I was still half asleep. Some of you are going to feel guilty right here. Laura reached over and Laura will heal this headache in the name of Jesus. Lord, please. Yes, Lord. Jesus, heal this headache. Amen. I pulled my hand over to me. And the Holy Ghost dealt with me and said, You didn't pray for that woman yesterday like that. How often have we called ourselves touching God's throne when we wasn't touching the throne at all? How often we call ourselves asking God for something when really we're praying amiss and it's all about what well, is it's a carnal thing to consume upon our own lust. How often? Have we not stayed in the altar long enough to even pray until we've prayed through? I wonder this morning if it would change any of our perspective if we knew that if we were willing to sacrifice in an altar prayer that we would get an answer. I, I wonder if it would change the way any of us pray. What if you knew this morning you've been praying, God, baptize me with the Holy Ghost. Sanctify me. Purge out these old worldly desires and, and fill me with the Holy Ghost. What if you knew that if you prayed for three days, you see in the Bible they were led, they prayed for ten days in the upper room. What if God dealt with you and showed you that if you prayed for three days that he was going to give you that answer that you longed for? Would you be willing to do that? You see, I know I'm not preaching about fasting this morning, but let me tell you something. These sacrifices that you make, whether it be prayer or fasting, many times we don't get the answer that we're asking for because we're not sincere in our intentions. We don't want it bad enough. We really don't want it that bad. I read a story, and I'm closing with this this morning. You can come and pray if you want. I read a story, Brother Tim, about a man that laid by Bethesda's pool who wanted to get in that pool so bad that he laid around there waiting for the right moment, the right time to get in it. You see... There are some of us that we're too far out from the coping of the pool. We, we are comfortable to, to live at a distance from the answer. But this man says, when the answer comes, I want to be close enough that I can get in. I wonder how many of you this morning says, Brother Myers, I'm guilty. I'm guilty as charged. I've been needing God to do some great things in my life. Brother Myers, what's the third kind of prayer? I've told you about two. The third kind of prayer is fervent prayer. The Bible said that an effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, when you begin to pray fervently, when your prayer takes on passion and meaning, and it's the very opposite of an empty prayer, and you pray from the depths of your heart. There's evidence in the Bible that when we pray fervently, that God answers. You've got a lost sister or brother. Your marriage is on the rocks. You're having job problems. You're broke all the time. You've been needing an answer. You've been needing a breakthrough. Let me ask you this morning, 
Are you praying fervently? Are you really getting down to business with God praying as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Prayed in such a way that the Bible said that his sweat became as great drops of blood. Lord, I want you to use me. God, I want you to help me. Friend, I want you to be reminded and understand this morning that you can have a whole camp meeting worth of people gather around you to help you pray. But if you're praying empty, if you're praying carnal, all of those people gathered around you are not going to be able to do much good for you. But when you begin to get sincere within yourself, and you say, I need an answer more than I need another breath of life, honey, your actions will begin to prove it. When you get to the place that you say, our church needs revival worse than anything, if you're like me as a pastor, I've prayed and said, God, Send us people that can help us. Send us people that can give strength to the church. Send people that can work. But I have to admit to you, there have been times before that I haven't prayed as sincere as I should. But I'm praying this morning, God, change our attitude. Change our altitude. Change our perspective. And help us to begin to pray fervently. God, if I've prayed carnally, forgive me. If I've prayed empty prayers with very little intention or meaning, forgive me. But teach me how to pray fervently. Teach me. They came to Jesus and they said, Lord, when he was done praying, Lord, teach us how to pray. Husbands, wives, fathers, wouldn't you like for your family to be able to come to you and say, Daddy, teach me how to pray. Mama, teach me how to touch the throne. All because when they watch Mom and Daddy pray, they can tell Mom and Daddy gets a hold of something. Mom and Daddy gets a hold of the glory of God. Mom and Daddy knows some of you have got grandparents, parents, maybe some that have already died and gone on, that you looked up to them because they knew how to pray. Are you leaving the same legacy, my friend? You need direction right now. Pray. Pray fervently. Father, in the name of Jesus, honey.